Good morning and welcome to Paradise Valley United Methodist Church traditional online worship. Hello, I'm Reverend Brenda Smith. We welcome each of you with open arms, no matter who you are. Jesus' love is radical and excludes no one. It does not matter your race, economic status, sexual orientation, age, or anything else. We are blessed when we worship together as God's people. We especially welcome our first-time worshipers and those that still feel new. We are grateful you have joined us to celebrate God in our lives, who never leaves us or forsakes us. If you would like to follow the order of the worship and get the words to the songs, please click on the bulletin button on your screen. Also, I invite you to take a moment to fill out the connection card on another tab on your screen. This helps us know who worshiped with us today, and you can share your prayers and requests with us. As we prepare our hearts and minds to enter into worship, please join me in prayer. Gracious God, your mercies are new every day. We are grateful for your constant presence in our lives that draws us near to you. Lord, be our holy guest this hour. May the songs we sing, the prayers lifted up, the scripture we read, and the message shared bring you glory and praise from our hearts to yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey friends, good morning. I know that today a lot of you are getting ready to start back at school. It is such an exciting time. There are so many new things to learn and ways to grow. For me, going back to school was always a little bit like celebrating New Year's. When a new school year began, I used to love making a school year resolution and enjoyed imagining what that year might be like. Kind of like this blank sheet of paper, the school year can be whatever you choose to make of it. Most people will print, write, or color on a piece of paper, but one of my favorite things to do with paper is origami. For those of you who don't know, origami is the art of Japanese paper folding. It's so fun to take something simple and be able to turn it into just about anything. The same way that God's love helps to form us as we grow in faith. Now I'm going to give you some time to go get a piece of paper of your own, but hurry back. There's something I want you to do with it. Are you ready? It's okay if you're not. I'm going to share everything that I do today on our PVUMC Kids Facebook page just in case you missed something. The first thing we need to do is that if your piece of paper isn't already a square, we need to make it one. You might need some help with this part. So you just fold the edge here and then we're going to cut off right along the top. So once you have your square, I want you to watch, listen, and follow along with me. I wrote this prayer for all of you for your new school year. Dear God, bless us as we come together for a new school year. From the smallest to the tallest, from the closest to the furthest, from the nearest to the dearest, thank you for always loving us. Amen. Now I have this heart to remind me of God's love for the entire school year. I bet that everyone's heart is a little bit different. Maybe yours is a different color. Maybe yours is bigger or smaller. Maybe yours even has writing on it. The same way each of these folded hearts is special each of you are uniquely and wonderfully created by God. I know that no matter what this year brings us, that God will always love you and be with you. You know, I think I might keep this heart on my desk where I can see it every day and be reminded of God's love. I wonder where you all will keep your heart. Before we end today, friends, I'm going to ask our entire congregation to join in and provide a blessing for everyone going back to school. Please share some words of encouragement in the chat or press that heart button to share a blessing with everyone heading back to school. Teachers, students, administrators, support staff and families, please know that your entire church family is praying for you and loves you very much. I hope you all have a great school year. I can't wait to hear all about it. Good morning, church family. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors at PVUMC. You know, one of the things we've been saying throughout this entire time of social distancing during the COVID-19 pandemic is that even though we cannot be together, that doesn't mean the work of our church has slowed down. In fact, many of you know that our church has been busier than ever bringing the love of Jesus out into the lives of others. This morning, we are celebrating 12 people who have decided that they want to commit themselves to the work of our faith community by becoming members of Paradise Valley United Methodist Church. These individuals have been to our introductory PVUMC 101 class and then PVUMC 201, which is our membership class. Then they sat down with myself and Katie Ingalls, our new connections director, in two groups to take their vows of membership over Zoom. 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty act of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. I present Dee Dee Samanza and Regina Cahindo, Cahindo Francine to reaffirm their faith. Joanne and Sean hey. Cookson, Bilda Hahn and Trisha Habak, and Patty Garabedian Tanner and Michael Tanner uh, to reaffirm their faith. And I, read, and I present Camille Wall and Bryce Asanek comes seeking profession, professing membership from the Dove of Desert UMC, Glendale, Arizona, and Desert Foothills UMC, Phoenix, Arizona, respectively, as well as Anne Marie and Dennis Kassenfeld, who comes seeking professing membership from Chambly, First United Methodist Church in Chambly, Georgia. And now, church, we offer up uh, some of the earliest vows that the church has, has asked people to, uh, to take uh, as, as a sign of their loyalty and faith to Christ. Um, candidates for uh, membership uh, take these solemn vows that were also made for them at their baptism. So now, uh, those of you that are joining the church, I have some questions for you. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. I do. I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord, in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, all nations, and all races? If so, say, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. And now, according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in this world? If so, say, I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. People of God, the membership ceremony requires two parts, the vows from those who are joining and those from our church. I now ask you to join along with one another all over the world as the words appear on the screen. Do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. So for uh, Didi and Francine, the two of you are joining the church for the first time. So uh, Didi Osmanza and Regina Kikindo Francine, as members of Christ's Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, the two of you can say, I will. Yes, I will. So Joanne and Sean, Bill and Trish, Patty, and Michael, as members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. I will. I will. For the other four of you, um, Cameo, Wall, and Bryce Osnack, Anne-Marie, and Dennis Kastenfeld, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. I will. I will. And now let me offer this uh, prayer of blessing over you as we uh, wrap this ceremony up. May the God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ to establish you and strengthen you that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Amen. 
And now, members of the household of God, I commend these 12 persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Amen. Good morning. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious and awesome God, we come to you with joy in our hearts and celebrate the community you have provided us here at PVUMC. Although afar, we still feel and know your generous spirit through the love this community extends to one another. We pray that we can not only be a welcoming and worshipful place, but a place that is known for its extreme generosity, kindness, love, and acceptance. So we come to you knowing that we sometimes fall short of what we can hope to represent in the world. When our spirits are restless and unsettled, when peace is nowhere to be found, the grace of God wraps around us. We do not rush through periods of darkness, but welcome their gifts that transform. In seasons of despair, truth comes to wrestle with us. In silence, honesty voices its concerns. From the unknowns that surround, possibilities emerge. Courage calls us to linger patiently in discomfort. In the light of day and the dark of night, God is with us. Holy Spirit, come and wrestle with our hearts. Push and pull on our self-understandings. Challenge our perceptions that confine and confront our thinking that leads us to harm. Meet us in the places deep within and let your spirit lead us in truth and healing. May your spirit resonate through our hearts today and may you join our many voices as one in the body as we pray the way you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Hi, I'm Anne-Marie Kastenfeld, and today's scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. This isn't a sermon about Peter. I know we all want it to be. I mean, even if you aren't a devout Christian, most people have heard this biblical story about Jesus walking on the water. And there, like always, is Peter getting out of the boat and taking a few uncertain steps on the water towards Jesus before he begins to sink like a rock. And of course, the tendency whenever we read this story is to talk about Peter. I've heard so many sermons and Sunday school lessons and youth group talks about how we should be like Peter and get out of the boat to show our faith to Jesus or not be like Peter and keep our eyes on Jesus in the midst of the storm. It's one of those Bible stories that has become so common, so ubiquitous within our faith tradition that we are often guilty of, of passing it by without much deeper thought. It's just assumed this story is about Peter, but it isn't. Let's just admit it. For those of us that grew up in the church, the Bible can become almost too familiar. But this morning, I want to take this well-known story and I want to offer up three tips you can use to read the Bible with, with new eyes, to see it in new ways, and to come away with different insights for your own spiritual journey. You don't need to be a pastor to do any of this. Just have an open heart and willingness to set aside your preconceived notions. When we approach these sorts of stories in the Bible, we often forget that they are set in the larger context of the books in which they were written. I mean, we don't necessarily forget that this story is part of the book of Matthew, but we often approach these shorter stories like they are a collection of individual fables, each with their own little moral or lesson, not part of a larger interconnected narrative. See, in the earliest days of the Christian faith, long before the invention of the printing press, there was only a few copies of the Gospel of Matthew in existence. So churches and faith communities would often share these books, passing them along to one another. And when they got one, they'd sit together and someone would read the entire thing out loud to those who were gathered. And Matthew knew this was how his story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus would be read. So he created connections and callbacks and foreshadows throughout the entire book that his original audience would have immediately identified. But the problem is that we don't do that nowadays. On most Sundays, we're lucky to get more than a few verses in a single sitting. And as a result, we often miss the larger meanings that are lurking just below the surface. So that leads me to my first pro tip to reading the Bible with new eyes. Consider the context. One of the things we can do when we read our Bible, and especially when we encounter well-worn stories like this one, is to look at the events within the larger book that come immediately before and after what we are reading. Take this one, for instance. The story of Jesus walking on water is in the middle of chapter 14 of the book of Matthew, around two-thirds of the way through the entire book. Jesus's ministry is just beginning to pick up 
steam, and he has become increasingly popular. But if we go back a few verses to the beginning of the chapter, we find some important background to this story that helps flesh it out and give us a deeper level of insight into this story. See, this story takes place in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33, but the chapter actually begins with the execution of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, at the hands of Herod. And remember, John is Elizabeth's son, the beloved aunt that Jesus' own mother, Mary, chose to visit in her hour of need during her pregnancy. The way that Matthew tells the story, Jesus and John were, were more than just close friends. They were practically brothers. Before anyone else, way back in Matthew chapter 3, John is among the first people to proclaim that Jesus is a big deal. And of all the conventional religious leaders that he could have chosen, Jesus chooses his own cousin to be the one who baptizes him. In the very first chapters of the story, Matthew establishes that these two, John and Jesus, have an extraordinary bond between them. And then, out of nowhere... John is imprisoned and executed by a high-ranking local government official. They headed for no good reason other than the pettiness of human greed and selfishness. John's closest friends seek out Jesus while he's speaking at one of his rallies, and, and they break the devastating news to him. And this leads us up to tip number two on how to read the Bible with new eyes. Imagine the emotion. Part of the danger in the fabulization of Bible stories is that, that we forget that it is ultimately a human story filled with people full of hopes and fears and dreams and shortcomings and ambitions. But when we attempt to place ourselves into the narrative, to, to really imagine what the people of our scriptures must have felt in those moments, we take another step towards a richer understanding of the book and of ourselves. I mean, just look at this story. Can you imagine the shock and the pain that Jesus is experiencing on learning of his cousin's death? John, practically a brother to him, has been murdered. We can see the pain in his eyes, hear the disbelief and, and the immeasurable sorrow pour out of his dry mouth. In chapter 14, verse 13, Matthew tells us that upon hearing about the news, Jesus withdrew by boat to a solitary place. He got on a boat, alone, and attempted to find some space to grieve. For that moment, Jesus was done with the speeches, the crowds, the miracles, and the lessons. John was dead, and Jesus needed to process his grief. We often forget that one of the key beliefs of the Christian faith is that Jesus was paradoxically fully God and fully man. Stories like Jesus walking on the water emphasize his divine nature, but it's stories like this one that remind us that Jesus knew the sorrow of humanity as well. We're living in a time in which people are learning, like Jesus, to grieve in new ways. The rise of cases of COVID-19 means that more people are dying as well. More loved ones are saying goodbye to friends and family members before they had ever expected. Each week, we have more people at the church contacting us, asking us to pray for their brothers and nieces and coworkers and neighbors who have contracted the virus. Some of them get better. But some of them don't. And it is in the midst of all of this loss, this pain, that, that Jesus is made more real to us through stories like this. Jesus shuts down things down, and he pulls back from his daily obligations to find some, some time and some space for himself. Jesus shows us that mourning is a natural part of grief, that the loss of loved ones can upend our sense of normalcy in ways that we'd never expected. But the Bible tells us that, that the crowds that were following Jesus continued to persist. They followed him out into the shoreline, hoping to hear from him. They pressed along the edges of the water, following the boat as best as they could. And as Jesus looked out towards those who were gathered there, we are told that he had compassion on them, even in spite of his grief. And so he pulled up to the shore, pushed back the feelings of sorrow he held for just a moment, and he healed those who had come to see him. And he fed them, using only a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. But let's not get distracted by the miracle here, because 
we are attempting to read the story with new eyes. Instead, let us consider the context and imagine the emotion of this moment. Jesus, in spite of his own issues, is asked to rise up and help others. And he does. He pushes aside his own needs and he gives what little he has to those that he can. And while this would be a great lesson on sacrifice, let's not jump into too quickly to moralizing. Not yet, anyway. Instead, Let us consider the moments in our own lives when we have felt overwhelmed with grief only to be asked to give a little more. How many of us listening today have had to process the shock of not only losing our day-to-day routine, not only having to transition to endless video calls and Zoom meetings, not only to taking care of our children's educations totally online, not only to making sure that our businesses keep their doors open in spite of a, a horrendous economy, not only to caring for our elderly parents who can't even see us in person, but doing it all without missing a beat. And even when we have attempted to leave on our own boats, to be alone for just a moment, to process our grief and our fear, we find that the hustle and bustle of our everyday responsibilities keep crowding around the shorelines of our lives. So we put on a smile and we give a little more. We do what is expected of us. We heal who we can and we feed those we can. And in that way, perhaps we understand now more than ever the hidden pain that Jesus felt on that beach amongst those crowds. Finally, Jesus has enough, which brings us to today's scripture reading. After the whirlwind of the last few days, the Bible tells us in verse 22 that Jesus made his disciples get on the boat and cross to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. He made his disciples leave him alone. It wasn't a request. There wasn't any other option. Jesus, at his wit's end, deep in the midst of his own mourning, needed to be alone. And so he forces his closest friends to depart for the other side of the sea, says goodbye to those gathered there, and he finds a quiet place on the side of a mountain to pray. And I don't think It's a huge leap of imagination to think that Jesus wasn't saying scripted, wordies, holier-than-thou church prayers. No, there are times in life when the only prayer that any of us have to offer is a guttural sobbing, a gasping breath. Jesus went up onto that mountain alone to be real and to be connected to God. Meanwhile, the disciples are out in their boat attempting to make their way across the sea in the midst of torrential rain and fierce wind. The waves swell and slam into the side of the boat, and at any moment, they are in danger of capsizing and being thrown out into the deep, dark water. Throughout our scriptures, deep water has symbolized the chaotic unknown. Before the creation of the world, we are told that the Lord hovered over the surface of the deep water. When God confronts Job in the Old Testament, he asks if Job could tame the monsters of the sea like like God could. And in this story, we see a small group of fishermen struggling to keep their boat afloat in the middle of a storm. We find that the weather is reflecting the exhausting, breakneck pace of the narrative before it. You can see the weariness on the faces of the disciples. You can feel their fear. But then suddenly, they look out into the dark mist, and they see a figure walking towards them on the water. And they are terrified, of course, because what sort of creature would be spawned from the depths of chaos? They don't recognize that it is Jesus, the broken and tired man that they had left on the shoreside just a few hours earlier. Perhaps because there was something different about him. Something in the way that he walked or the way he casually walked over the deep, deep waters. And Jesus shouts out to them to take courage, to fear not. And he gets into the boat with them. And the winds relent. And the rain stops. And the storm is over. This is not a sermon about Peter. It doesn't need to be. Because the final Bible reading tip I have for you to read the Bible with new eyes is to alter our assumptions. As I considered the context and imagined the emotion this week, I realized that this story of Jesus walking on the water isn't necessarily all about Peter and his little faith, as I had been so quick to automatically assume. Instead, 
I would actually contend that it became about the process of grief and the importance of self-care for me this week. And when we fixate so much on Peter and his attempts to walk on water, we miss the main character of the story, Jesus. Despite a busy schedule, despite the obligations that were placed upon him, despite all of the other excuses he might have had to ignore his own needs, Jesus made time to be alone with God. He carved out time for prayer. He took care of himself. I love the image of Jesus, freshly renewed after his time with God, walking out over the chaos of the storm and resuming his holy work of saving others. And we see then that this is a constant theme throughout Matthew's gospel. Jesus, in the middle of stressful and urgent situations, taking time to care for his own spirituality and well-being, even up until his eventual arrest and execution on the cross. And perhaps for those of us who are struggling to keep up with life, this is just the thing we need to hear this morning. You can't care for others without caring for yourself. You don't need to do this all alone. If you listen close to the rest of the book of Matthew, you'll notice that the nature of Jesus' ministry changes after his incident on the sea. Whereas before, he healed people by touching them and blessing them. People now could merely touch his garments and be healed of what they were suffering from. It's as if Jesus is radiating power and authority in a way that he hadn't just a few days earlier. It's almost as if his personal encounter with God out on that mountain empowered him to carry out his holy work in a new, life-giving way. People of God, may we give ourselves permission to create the space we need to care for ourselves, to go on hikes or listen to music or sit in nature or simply drive for the sake of driving. May we find our mountainside and rest in the healing power of God so that we may be for the world the body and presence of Jesus, fully rested and ready for the holy work of love. And may we continue to read the Bible with new eyes, seeing ourselves in new ways and reminding ourselves that it isn't always about Peter. Amen. As we enter into this time of offering, I want to say thank you on behalf of PVUMC for your financial pledges to the work of the church. It may seem that not much is going on since we are not meeting in person, but you may be surprised. Did you know the church campus is getting a nice makeover, repairs, and procedures in place when we return? A new open table was started in July. We have two active tables now. And we have contracted with ministry architects to work with children's ministry staff, leaders, teachers, and parents to set up this ministry for future growth and a firm foundation. You may give using the Give tab on your screen or go to pvumc.org backslash give now for one time or recurring gift. We are also aware that some of you may need help in this season of economic downturn because of the COVID pandemic. If you need more assistance, please contact Pastor Dave Summers or Pastor Christopher Werps. The phone number of the church is 602-840-8360. Will you join me as we pray together over our offering? Loving God, your grace provides us with secure shelter even amid our times of doubt and despair. Our lives periodically seem adrift from the refuge of your unwavering love. Lift us from the depths of selfishness and greed, restore our hope, and help us to find contentment in you so that we may offer these financial gifts as devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.
joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave. Be we would be always blessing, serve thee as thy hosts above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing, glory in thy perfect love. Thanks for joining us this morning. We are grateful to worship with you every week. Before Pastor Christopher offers up a benediction and blessing, I want to take this time to let you know about a couple of great things going on at PVUMC. First, it's really important to us that we create long-lasting community and friendships. So if you are new or feel new and have never had the chance to meet and chat with any of our pastors, we want to extend that opportunity to you. Today at 10 a.m., we are having a PVUMC 101 session. It's a brief, casual introduction to our church, and we would love for you to join us to get to know one another a little better and see if there are any ways we can be serving you as a church. You can learn more and register at pvumc.org 101. Secondly, we are extremely proud and excited to tell you about the new Serendipities website. Serendipities, our beautiful and well-supplied gift shop, has been a PVUMC ministry for many years, but has just recently gone online. You can purchase your favorite gifts, treats, books, cards, you name it, from the comfort of your own home. Your purchases help support local nonprofits, camp scholarships, and ministry efforts in our church. Just one more way to be God's love in action. And remember, for more information on this or other activities going on at the church, check out our website at pvumc.org. Okay, that will do it. As we prepare to head out into our week, Pastor Christopher will offer a blessing and benediction now. Thanks for coming to worship today. We hope that you found this time to be meaningful and important, and that it encouraged you to take your next steps in faith. If you're interested in anything that's going on at the church, you can check out pvumc.org. Or you can look us up on Facebook. And now hear and receive this benediction from the Lord. You are the beautiful people of God. And God loves you with an absolutely perfect love. This week, find a way to love this world that desperately needs to be loved. And love as Christ loves you. And the peace of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ will be yours now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.